Everybody, well, the big political story of the morning is in the Sunday Times, which says revealed Theresa May's secret Brexit deal. Well, it, there's no great surprise to anyone that listens to this show, because I've been saying for weeks that we're very, very close to a deal. It's a deal that will keep us in the customs union. It's a deal uh, that will give us the promise of perhaps jam tomorrow. It's a deal where, we'll be, where we're going to be told that the Irish border situation is solved. The devil will, of course, be in the detail, and David Davis writes in the same newspaper saying he wants to see the full legal guidance. He wants it to be out there and to be published. And over the course of the next hour or so, we're going to debate you know, is this deal a price worth paying? Uh, but before I get to that and get to you, I'm going to speak to somebody who's seen a lot of political crises in his life. He's a former Minister of State for the Foreign and Commonwealth Office under Margaret Thatcher. He was the Secretary of State for National Heritage under John Major. And he's seen one or two political crises over the years. David Mellor, good morning. Morning, Nigel. Before we get on to the politics of it, uh, David, the news that broke within the last hour was that the former Cabinet Secretary and Head of the Civil Service, Sir Jeremy Haywood, has died from cancer at the age of 56, and uh, Theresa May's been leading tributes to him. I understand that you knew him. Oh, yes, he worked in... Uh, he was a senior private secretary uh, in my office when I was Chief Secretary of the Treasury, and then, of course, for the Chancellor, Norman Lamont. My abiding memory of Jeremy is him working hard into the night, uh, processing papers, but also uh, wreathed in cigarette smoke with um, a large ashtray completely filled to overflowing with uh. things. And uh, uh, I remember thinking, you know, shouldn't I be saying to him, Jeremy, come on, you don't need uh, so much of that stuff. But anyway, uh, sadly... He has died age 56, and the tragedy for him is that, of course, he had settled in as the most senior civil servant uh, in this country and had a lot more to give, which he can't give and we can't benefit from. No, very sad. Well, we pass on condolences to his family, to his friends, and David, thank you for telling us about the man himself. Now, David... You've probably seen this story uh, out there today. Theresa May is pretty close to signing up to a deal, and I have to say, I think it's pretty much certain that she is going to sign up uh, to keeping us into a customs union. I mean, how do you see this? Do you think that this is a price worth paying to get us out of the EU legally at the end of March next year? Uh, I'm in two minds about it, Nigel, and I think we will want to study the small print about it. But, you see... Uh, the, the thing about Brexit, and heaven knows, I'm teaching my granny to suck eggs here. Uh, <laughs> you are one of the principal advocates of Brexit. But the whole idea behind Brexit was it would give us the freedom of the seas. It would allow us to make uh, arrangements as um, uh, appropriate uh, that would, for the benefit of Britain without being tied down by EU rules and, of course, by a lot of other um, difficult EU rules on uh, immigration and so on. And the danger has always been uh, Brino, Brexit in name only. Uh, I think staying in the customs union smacks to me of Brexit in name only. But what do you think? I mean, you know, this well, is not I so mean, much I, you asking me questions, but a discussion. Well, you know a hell yeah, of a lot about this. I tell you what I think. I think that she's already said she wants the transition period to go on for a further year, to the end of 2021. Uh, we're due a general election that has to take place by the spring of 2022. So basically... At the time of the next general election, we are uh, going, if she gets this deal through Parliament, we are going to be in a position where we've not taken back control of our borders, not taken back control of our fisheries, we're not able, we're not able to make uh, our own trade deals, and financially, it won't be 39 billion we've given the eu it'll be something closer to 60 billion so i have to say uh, david to me uh, it doesn't give us any of the possible benefits of brexit i know that school kids in 100 years will read we left the treaty uh, but i think it needs to be opposed uh, but you went through all of this i mean you saw this with the tory rebels back at maastricht and in the end they towed the line with john major will they do so this time? oh i think it's i think it's a completely different situation Maastricht was really um, about trying to get us some freedom within the EU framework. 
and um, and the the bees. I suppose we better what what watch our language here. John Major termed the bees. He Michael did. Michael Patillo's <laughs> in this world. I think Michael's now <laughs> relented of all of that. Um, th- they were a relatively small group, although any group was a big group when John Major didn't have a majority, and any group is a big group when Theresa May doesn't. But I think, you know, the problem with all of this is the salesman. You know, if someone tries to sell you a used car, if the guy seems like a spiv, you're more sceptical. If the guy seems to be, you know, a polished individual who could be your brother, then you might say, that car's great and I'm going to buy it. Well, I mean... The problem for Theresa May is that she doesn't have a lot of credibility in either knowing what she stands for and then standing up for Britain's interests in trying to get it. I mean, I was checking through a few of my notes on these matters and came across uh, two comments from her backbenchers, one on one side of the debate, the other on the other, which um, really sum up the amount of cynicism and scepticism there is on the Tory benches about Theresa May. Johnny Mercer, you know, an ex-soldier, yep. brave fellow, he, he's a Brexiteer, he said, does she think there's nothing worth fighting for? And I think that gets to the heart of the matter. Theresa May is not a fighter. Remember, she opted out of the referendum campaign. Yeah, she, she was on nothing. the Remain side. And then, but, of course, yeah. benefited from yeah, yeah. I mean, but, and, but, then, but, and, and 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 even and, and if I might just quote the other one yeah. from the other side, Nick Bowles, uh, who's a um, you know a, 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 a stalwart thinker of original thoughts, who's a Remainer, but he said the trouble with Theresa May, she thinks one more concession and she'll get a deal, and you know that is the worry, and I believe when she exposes this stuff. I think a lot of people will think if you'd fought harder, if you'd been a different sort of person. Yeah, let's go back to a cliche. I was Margaret Thatcher's youngest minister for four years. I served in her government for nine years, another two under John Major. Margaret Thatcher was a fighter. Theresa May is not a fighter. Would Margaret Thatcher be accepting a lot of this no, guff? And what's absolutely led up to no it? way. No, absolutely no, no, no way. No, no, yes, no. yes. I mean, you can see that. But I mean, what happens at the next election? I mean, I know in '97 that the Conservative Party had been in power for a long time, uh, but it had been very split over this European issue, giving Blair a huge opportunity. But if I'm a Conservative voter that believes in Brexit, and I get to the next election, and I've I've been told by Theresa May that I've got Brexit, but we have, we've still effectively got open door immigration. We're still paying away money. I mean, couldn't this have disastrous electoral consequences for them? Look, Nigel, this to me, and I started taking an interest in sad life I have led. I started taking an interest in politics in my mid-teens. So I've been politically aware for more than 50 years and politically active for a lot of that time. I have never, ever, ever felt more depressed about the state of British politics. Mm. Well summed up, I think it was Douglas Hurd who said years ago, the issues get bigger and the politicians get smaller. Mm. And I think when you look at, you know, the, uh, the battle of the pygmies in the Tory party as to who will replace Theresa May, she's only there because she isn't one of them. And that's why she'll stay, because she isn't one of them. There's no obvious leader with any Thatcherite, let alone Churchillian qualities. But when you cast your eye around the rest of the political landscape, I mean, a Corbyn government would be a complete disaster for Britain. Britain would be led from further left than any British government has ever gone before. It would remind me, you know, I'm old enough to have been a Foreign Office minister before the Iron Curtain fell. It'll be like revisiting East Germany, uh, where, you know, where, run by a bloke called Eric Honecker. Do you remember him? Yeah, well, absolutely. Uh, well, I mean, um, Jeremy Corbyn can be our Eric Honecker. And then you've got the Lib Dems, led by a charming fellow, but now way past his sell-by date. Where are the leaders to tackle the big problems they don't No, I think that's a very fair exist. point. But I have to say, I think Mr Corbyn's chances of getting to power uh, will be increased if she gets this deal through. That's just my thought on it. But another area where leadership is being discussed heavily, is, of course, in Saudi Arabia. This new MBS, Mohammed Bill Salman, comes in, and we're told that Saudi Arabia is going to reform and women start driving, and you know Saudi Arabia well. What do you think the damage is between Saudi and the West after the murder of the journalist Khashoggi? 
Well, I think it's a terrible thing. And, you know, um, I, uh, I've been to the Gulf on a lot of occasions. I first went to the Gulf nearly 40 years ago. And I have always been a stalwart supporter of uh, the Gulf states on the basis they are a bastion against extremism. And um, it's good to have a friendly hand on the oil pump, as it were. But I look at what's happening in Saudi Arabia and feel deeply depressed. Um, the gerontocracy that has traditionally run Saudi Arabia continues with King Salman, 82, and believed to be suffering from dementia. His son, Mohammed bin Salman has seized power and seems to be an extremely reckless young man. First of all, uh, destroying the unity of the Gulf by, um, as it were, driving, um, putting Qatar onto the naughty step. There may be reasons for that, but um, on the whole, the Gulf survives best when it is united. This dreadful war in Yemen, cruel war in Yemen, where a lot of... In which, country faces mass in which starvation. You, and in and which UK all, weapons are being used, David. I mean, you know, things uh, that we manufacture are being used there. Well, but I, I think, in a way, that's a side show. You, know, I, I, you mustn't, Nigel, just because you're, you're a broadcaster, you don't mind me saying so, fall into the easy trap of facile comments about... Well, a little bit you know, of balance, a little bit everything of balance, is, you know. Everything's I mean, awful. I mean, no, I mean, well, everything, every, everything, every, everything is our fault. But look, let me get to the main point. It's my fault for rambling off and giving you a chance to do this stuff <laughs> at the broadcast, you know, I, 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 an objective broadcaster stuff, a, a cap that fits uneasily, I'm sure you will agree. Well, I'm um, doing my best, David, you know. <laughs> but well, look, um, not a laughing matter what we now come to. I I've never known anything like it for in the Gulf where uh, a journalist who isn't even a fanatic, it's not like he's a fanatical jihadist, but a moderate principled man who writes about the virtues of Saudi Arabia taking on democratic values. He's lured into uh, the consulate uh, in Turkey. He is then either hacked to pieces or strangled, set upon in a carefully planned operation where 15 men fly in and then fly out. Mm. It's an appalling, wretched, violent, vicious thing. And look, I don't care what anyone says. You know, I, I forget it was in, in, it was in Lewis Carroll character, character who could believe 50 impossible things before breakfast. But you know what? I cannot believe that Mohammed bin Salman wasn't up to his neck in all of no, this. No. And my guess, Mystic Mello, you know, predicts that he has enough enemies within the kingdom, including a number of people who were bounced out of the succession by him suddenly announcing himself as the successor to King Salman, thereby breaking the line. I suspect MBS may be on the way out. The only issue is when. But Saudi has lost. Look, Saudi doesn't have a great reputation, let's be honest. Internally, it's a repressive country, women's rights and things like that. I mean, although he now allows them to drive an alien. Even worse, you know, Nigel, and something that uh, uh, dear old Ken Livingston of blessed memory, when I used to do a show with him, yep. he always went on about, and you know, he wasn't wrong. The extent to which Saudi money has been used in sensitive places like Pakistan and indeed the UK to subsidize extremist mosques, yeah, preaching this is, this is the, the kind of fanatical, yeah. yes, yeah. and the fanatical view of Islam, which, you know, when you look at some poor woman who had a row with some of her is Islamic female friends, and she's now been in prison for nine years, threatened with death. And, and, and they're now saying, because she's being let off the death penalty, uh, they're going to sort of do all manner of other awful things. What has happened to reason in this world? And Saudi Arabia has to carry a lot of the blame. Yeah, well, I for felt this. I have to say. in Pakistan. I felt this. For, I've said this, too, for some time. And finally, what does Mystic Mellor say? Are we leaving the European Union on March the 29th at 11 p.m. or not? I don't think so, because I think oh, there are dear. too many untied laces. But, you know, what I find extraordinary, Nigel, is uh, that Theresa May really doesn't have any idea of leadership. But those who claim to know so much better than her, the Blairs of this world, the Heseltines and all the rest of it, what they should be doing is going to their friends in the EU, instead of lecturing 
uh, the British government. And they can make one of two points. One you will agree with, the other you won't. One point is, let us out on a sensible basis, because you, O oh mighty EU, have as much to lose, if not more, by an untidy exit for Britain uh, than the British do. But the other thing they could be saying is, if they think the British public got it wrong last time and should have another go, they should try and prevail upon the EU to start making the kind of concessions that David Cameron, who thinks he's coming back, by the way. No, no, I don't think so, is. somehow. I thought it was April the 1st when I, when I read that in the week. Anyway, but basically, you know, that, that, that David Cameron, when the world was young, like a few years ago, David Cameron promised that he was going to go and sort out the relationship with the EU. And, they, and if they didn't, wouldn't play ball and give Britain what was reasonable, he'd advocate going out. Well, they gave him nothing. And he advocated staying in, in the most ridiculously hysterical terms. But, you know, if, if some of these el so-called wise elder statesmen, the players of this world, wanted to do something useful, they try even this 11th hour to make the EU offer something that showed that their whole conduct yeah. negotiation is wrong. Now, you don't want that. No, I'm not don't. sure whether I want that. But something has got to change. No, they're almost, As it stands, it's a yeah. mess. No, they're actually, in, in my view, acting against the interests of our country. But hey, David, thanks ever so much for joining us. That was David Meller with a fairly pessimistic take, I would say, on what's happening in Saudi Arabia. A pessimistic take on the ability of Theresa May to resemble anything close to a leader. And he's also pessimistic on Brexit. But, as I say, the Sunday Times have told us the deal is basically done. If Is keeping the United Kingdom in a customs union a price worth paying in order to secure a deal? We'll debate that in a moment. But for now, you're listening to the Sunday edition of the Nigel Farage Show on LBC, and it's 20 minutes past 10. This is LBC. What's the smart way to enjoy a break from the old routine? Fly to Dublin with Aer Lingus from Gatwick and Heathrow and enjoy all the surprises of this incredible city. Take a stroll around Trinity College, visit Hoth and its beautiful harbour, or enjoy the breathtaking view from the Dublin mountains. Then round it all off with some live music at the famous Temple Bar. Flights from London start from just £32.99 each way as part of a return trip. Smart explores Dublin. Smart flies Aer Lingus. Book now at aerlingus.com. Offer subject to conditions and availability. Go, go, go. Ten ordinary people. Come on, guys. Move, move. 250 grand. Look at all that money. One incredible heist. If they can steal the cash. We need to get out of here as quick as we can. And evade a crack team of real police detectives. Right, can we get on with burying 25 grand, please? The money's theirs to keep. They think they've got away with it. They're not going to get away with it. The heist starts Friday the 9th of November, only on Sky One. If we catch them red-handed, cigars and croissants for us. It's Prince Charles as you've never seen him before in a joyously intimate photo album. Free inside Sunday's Mail on Sunday, page after page of enchanting, rarely seen pictures. In an unmissable 70th birthday souvenir edition of Event Magazine. Plus, top royal author Angela Levin reveals what's really made the Prince happy at 70. Charles's intimate photo album. Free inside Sunday's Mail on Sunday. Would you and your business benefit from a personal approach from your accountant? At Barnes Rofe, of course our partners have the technical skills needed to offer you first-class audit, tax and accounting advice. But most importantly, we'll work closely with you to help your business grow long-term. Perhaps it's time to see what we can do for you. Arrange your free consultation at BarnesRofe.com Barnes Rofe, clever accountants for business. So I still remember the feeling of walking into my GCSEs. Um, I think the weeks before I wasn't aiming that high. I kind of thought good was going to be good enough, so I didn't really try much harder. But then I remember in the final lesson, we each found a note on our desks. Our teacher had written us personal messages. Mine said, if you're going to think at all, think big. And if you're going to think big, think bigger. I was thinking small, but she inspired me to think otherwise. Teaching. Every lesson shapes a life. Search Get Into Teaching. If you started your own furniture store today, I doubt you'd call it Fishpools. But if the year was 1899 and your name was Ernest Fishpool, well, it was and he did. Today, Fishpools in Waltham Cross is one of the largest furniture stores in the southeast with a huge range of modern and classic styles. For up to 25% off and to view our new season furniture flooring and home accessories, visit fishpools.co.uk. 
That's a website, Ernest. So today, our most popular dishes are avocado on toast, or you can have avocado with chilli on toast, or there's the avocado with chorizo on toast, or you might like the avocado on toast with peppers, or there's avocado on toast with salmon, or you could try out avocado on toast with lemon. And for those that don't follow the herd, the new Jaguar I-Pace, our award-winning all-electric vehicle. Jaguar, a breed apart. Leading Britain's conversation. LBC, The Nigel Farage Show. As I've predicted here for weeks, a deal is very, very close. There'll be an announcement, no doubt, sometime this week that there'll be a quick summit in Brussels at some point in the end, towards the end of this month, and then will be uh, a big sort of ceremony on the 13th and 14th of December in Brussels. A deal is close, but would keeping the UK in a customs union be a price worth paying in order to get that deal? Tell me, if you think the answer is yes, call 0345 973 Maybe you think, actually, uh, it really isn't worth it. It's not what we fought for. Text to 84850. Maybe you see it as a capitulation, in which case tweet using the hashtag Farage and LBC at LBC. And, of course, you can watch us on Facebook and comment there too. Folks, this is not what I spent 25 years campaigning for. The idea that we're going to be stuck in something. Oh, of course, they'll tell us that there'll be an exit clause and we can leave at some point point in time and they're even telling us there's the possibility of a future economic partnership which will open up the prospect of a Canada type deal um, a prospect which somebody has described as, as as disappearing rather like invisible ink after we leave on March the 29th next year this is all about getting votes in the House of Commons but is it worth it Morris and Edgware is it worth it good morning to you Nigel can I ask you, before answering that question, a question? Go on. When you uh, proposed the leaving uh, the UK, leaving the, the uh, EU, yep. and as an MMP, you know all the rules and regulations, did you warn everybody that there were going to be problems in leaving? Uh, what I said was two things, Morris. Number one, logic says a simple free, tr- free trade deal should be an easy thing to do because it's more in their interest than it's in ours. And for some reason, Morris... Despite the fact Mr Tusk and others keep offering it, we haven't taken it up. Uh, and number two, I also said uh, during the referendum uh, that no deal was better than a bad deal. Uh, and even if we're threatened, and even if there are bumps in the road, we're taking, we're making a big decision that I believe to be absolutely right for our country. I understand, but you didn't foresee all these problems that have been put in, our, in the way of trying to get there, did you? I didn't foresee what I didn't, couldn't have foreseen was a British Prime Minister that simply didn't believe in it. And that's very much what David Mellor was just saying, wasn't it? Oh, and by the way, uh, following that on, especially with what the gentleman was saying before, uh, you talk about Mrs May and other people, uh, talk about other leaders. It depends on people behind the scenes, because if you take, for example, that uh, Mrs Thatcher, all those years ago, supposed to have had power, then how was it she was a user by other members of, the, uh, of her party? Well, in the end, they brought her down. Yes, that's true. But yes, but she, she had, didn't have power, did she? Well, for a long time she did, but hey, hey. No, hey. no, look, it's no good saying people have got power then, but on the other hand, there's an important line was put. You asked the question. Yeah. Is it worth the price yes. regarding leaving? Yes. Was it worth the price that it cost to keep the Nazis away from this country? Absolutely. And other parts of the world. Was it worth the price? Yes. Of course it was. Yes, and the price of the Spanish Armada. And you could argue that all through history, that actually some things aren't about money. I mean, this country bankrupted itself in two world wars, and we did it uh, because it was a right and it was the principal thing to do. So, no, Morris, there are things that matter more than money, and I have always argued that. Absolutely. Fair point. So let's get the business people on uh, on the air and let us hear from them what exactly they want to do. The business people who we depend on, not the governments. Well, the trouble with that, Morris, is there are two schools of thought. Uh, there is one group of businesses, predominantly big businesses, and they've got a letter again in the Times today, who do not want us to leave the European Union. Uh, and for many of them, the EU has been good. Uh, it's been a rule book that makes it quite difficult in many industries for small and medium-sized competitors uh, to challenge them. But they firmly want to stay in the EU, and that's one business voice. Then there's another business voice, which is people like James Dyson. It's people like 
Tim Martin, it, it, it is the vast majority of your local shopkeepers um, who say, why on earth do we need all these rules and regulations when only 12% of the UK economy is exporting to Europe? So, Morris, uh, you know, you pay your money. You... Nigel, Nigel, just yep. one last thing. Yep. Can you tell me why 28 nation governments in Europe allow themselves to be usurped by another body who, as you say, are unelected. Why is it so? Morris, I am against the whole European project. I want a new Europe based on nation states being friends. Morris, I thank you. David Mellor for PM, says Steve. Lawrence, <laughs> Lawrence is calling from Colchester. Lawrence, is it worth it? Good morning, sir. Good morning. No, it's, no, it's not. And it's nice to hear from David. Lovely guy. OK. No, I did, when I spoke to you three weeks ago, I was so upset with this uh, Theresa May and what she's done with Brexit. I, I would never believe then that now I have made my mind up and I will be voting for Corbyn. Wow. That's quite a big change for you, Lawrence, isn't it? It is. Uh, but the way that she and her party are so arrogant with the Brexiteers... The only way I can do anything with the little minimum amount of power that I've got is by my vote. Yep. And there is nobody else except Corbyn. And I'll take the consequences with Corbyn and his government, but I am disgusted mm. with this woman. Well, do, you know, really. do, you, do you know, Lawrence, David Davis said about a month ago there would be dire consequences if she stuck to this plan. And, Lawrence, you are one of those dire consequences, because I think there are quite a lot of people like you out there. Thank you very much indeed. Now, Conservatives very much enjoy what David Mellor had to say. Brilliant, realistic analysis from Mellor. A genuine Conservative. His demolition of Mrs May's leadership qualities was spot on. Chris in Coulston, I, I, I was surprised. He really was pretty withering about what well, he basically said she's not a leader, uh, and you can't be more damning than that. Staying in a customs union is not coming out of the EU. I get and on Twitter I get, basically we're staying in the EU. Uh, well, um, yeah, yes, but we will have left the treaty. So Brexit in name only. That is where this Prime Minister wants to take us. Mind you, she's getting lots of advice from former Prime Ministers. We'll talk about one of those in a moment. Blair's his name. You're listening to a Sunday edition of the Nigel Farage Show here on LBC. It's 10.30 in time. So Parliament is going to face a big choice at some point before very long. Do they back the Mrs May deal, which basically keeps us in the customs union, possibly for quite a long time? Is it for Brexiteers? a price worth paying and I've had a few of you on already saying no uh, but interestingly I'm not getting many of you calling 03456060973 saying it is because the other opinion is there should be a second referendum or we shouldn't be leaving at all and this middle way that Mrs May's trying to pursue has the last time I looked got the support of only about 10% of the country now one of those firmly on the other side of the argument, is, of course, Tony Blair, who writes in Today's Observer, uh, and he's basically saying that MPs should vote down any Brexit deal in Parliament and push for a second referendum. And he says, in a warning, if they fail to do so, there will be a backlash from voters that will last a political lifetime. Mr Blair, I don't think you have any idea of what the political backlash will be that could last for a very long time if you force the people of this country into voting again because you think they're a bunch of cretins who didn't know what they were doing. Oh, there'll be a backlash, all right, but it won't be on the side that you think. That's certainly my view. And that comes uh, amidst the news that Tony Blair has cost the taxpayer £1 million over the course of the last decade. And this is an allowance of up to £115,000 a year that former Prime Ministers can claim uh, to help them carry on with their public work. And there is a, bi a big argument over this because no receipts have to be uh, required. We did, in fact, change the rule and extend it from Prime Ministers to include Deputy Prime Ministers. So Mr Clegg has been a recipient of it as well. Slightly by the by, but it is interesting how hard... Blair is in campaigning to stop Brexit at all costs. I still very much think that the view of most people in this country, uh, whichever way they voted, is why don't we just get on with it? Iris in Thetford, is this a price worth paying? I mean, Iris, if we've if we've left the treaty, historically it's quite a big moment, isn't it? 
Uh, it is a big moment, but it's absolutely not a price worth paying, Nigel. Um, I think that the government have set this up almost from day one when they prevaricated over implementing Article 50. I think, um, you know, I was very pleased when we, when we won the referendum. Um, I'm, a, I'm a big Brexiteer. But as soon as that happened, I just thought this is the start of a slippery slope. And mm. I think it has been. I'm really sad to yep. say that. Yeah, no, I was saying quite sort of, you know, just a few months after her Lancaster House speech, I was saying the great Brexit betrayal has begun. I, I certainly feel that's where we go. Iris, let's put it to you like this. Imagine yourself sitting in the House of Commons with your passions and beliefs. If you vote against this deal, you risk the other side forcing an extension of Article 50 and then a second referendum. Now, I'm going to ask you, would that be a risk worth taking for Brexit MPs? Um, I, I think if they didn't, if they didn't take that risk, I think they're on a loser anyway. Because I, I, I think this is, I think this is our one big chance. You, you, you've kept, kept saying that yourself, Nigel, all the way along. Yep. This is our one big chance. Yeah. And I think if they stuff it up, they stuff it up, and I think we'll never get another chance. So I, I think they have to be brave here. And really, you know, the Brexiteers really need to stand strong. And take, because, and take that risk, Iris. They have to, Nigel. What, what else can they do? Okay. If they don't, okay. we're, 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 we're sunk anyway, aren't we? Because the, the prevarication will just go on. OK. Iris, thank you. And Iris saying they've got to stand up for their principles. Alf in Halifax criticises me. Why are you giving Blair the oxygen of publicity? Just ignore everything he says. Well, Alf, I'd like to, but you can't get away from it. Like him or not, he is still a significant global political player. He just is. A lot of you think Mellor was very, very good today. And I think his comments on leadership in particular, of what have really struck home, and he's basically said that in both our main parties there's never been a time when we've had such a very poor quality to choose from. Uh, and one of you, D, agrees by text and says, when the history of this period is written, it will show we had the worst generation of politicians in modern history. Victor is calling from Kempston in Bedfordshire. Good morning, Victor. Yes, hi. So... Um... Is, is Mrs May's deal is Mrs May's deal the right approach? Is it, from her perspective, the only approach? Well, I, I think uh, there's been a problem right from the start, and, and as you pointed out, and others, you're dealing with an ideology. This isn't uh, normal negotiations. They, as far as the, the Treaty of Rome is, the Treaty of Rome is holy scripture. Yep, it as is. As far as they're concerned. Oh, it is. It, and the, the four freedoms, as they keep repeating, are not negotiable. Um, so, so when you come up against that, then um, and, and also you'll find within the treaties a lot of um, um, inconsistencies. That are, they, Article Four says um, that they respect the political structure and identities of member nations, but in practice. They don't. Yeah, an article, an article eight, I think it is, says that they must try and strive to have the best relations possible with with other countries. Yeah, as, as, as you've also said, this is a club where you join but but can't leave. And Hotel California. Yeah, I've lost you. You've left. Oh well. Hey ho. There we go. Let's go to Weybridge in Surrey and speak to Gary. Gary, good morning. Good morning, Nigel. Good morning. So, what do you make of this deal? Well, the deal's a the deal's a pig's ear, Nigel. But I want to tell you that. I hold you accountable for this, uh -huh. uh, and uh, not no, not in a negative. Well, I was at Doncaster when you announced you were going to stay on with UKIP for the for the referendum and then leaving afterwards. Uh -huh. But you left at the very worst moment because it was always going to be a stitch. We knew the parliamentary parties themselves did, never expected to get a referendum vote to leave. Never expected it. That's why the referendum act itself was such a disastrous act with no with no action to follow. Right? Yeah. We just, we'll have a vote, and that was it. And that's why we ended up with Gina Miller in court, because it gave Parliament no right to act of itself. And, and without you leading UKIP, there was no force on the Tories to make them follow through. There was no pressure. It was all gone, and they were able to do well, another, another... I think, Gary, the truth of it is, the truth of it is that post the referendum, uh, I think the electorate took the view that UKIP had done its job, um, and I certainly... You know, wanted 
to be involved in any way I could. They didn't want me to be. So I kind of felt, Gary, at that moment in time, I'd done my job. No, but that's the whole point. And, and it, it was also the conference. It, it was the, the job was the getting the vote. That was the easy part. Relatively, that was the easy part. The hard part was always going to be this bit. Because those who didn't want to leave weren't going to, weren't going to give walk away from the fight uh, with a tail between their legs. And they have the le- hands on the levers of power. And the only way to fight this, the only way was to keep, was to keep a throttle on the necks of the Tories to make sure they followed through with a really clean Brexit. Now, it's well, Gary, way. UKIP, I mean, I mean, hang on. UKIP, UKIP's finished. That's UKIP still exists. It's got a leak. Fin- I mean, no, it's finished. No, it's, UKIP was you. I joined, I left whatever party I had because it was you and what, what you'd achieved over 20 years. Yeah. And I think when you, when you left away, what happened? Tory put, Labour, ex-Labour Party members of UKIP shot back to Labour, ex-Tories shot back to Tories, and UKIP was left then with the Scouse fellow, and it was the, 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 the whole thing was a, was a, was a... I have to say, Gary, I don't think if I'd led UKIP into the general election of 2017, I could have made much impact at all, because the public basically said, we've done it. Why are you still campaigning, Nigel? It's done. We're leaving. That's what the public believe. Now, of course, it has not turned out that way at all. Gary, it, you know, I mean, I wasn't going to be like Arthur Scargill and try and uh, make myself leader for life. Um, and I felt I'd done my bit. But, Gary, I take the criticism. I understand it. You're not alone in saying that. But I'm very pleased that I got out when I did. Robbie is calling from Edenbridge. Hi, Robbie. Morning, Nigel. Nice Good to morning. talk to you again, yes. old man. Don't we, forget I know your father, so be careful. Well, anyway. I, I know Robbie, and it's, his, <laughs> and, it's, and it's his birthday today, So, yeah, as oh, you mentioned him, so listen, there we are. Give him my very best wishes. <laughs> I certainly will. Nigel, again, I will say thank you from the heart of my 80 years or whatever. Now, here's a little parrot phrase for you. They need us more than we need them. And if these knowers keep on... A co- uh, just blabbing on about why can't we get out this, why can't we have hard to... Do they really think the EU is going to give up one of its best payers just like Of course that? not. They're of course fighting us not. every way of everything they can... And of course, unfortunately... Most of the things we 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 uh, we bring up, um, they're there ahead of us, ready to, ready to say no, no, no. And I, I'm I'm reasonably happy. I have no problems with with Mrs. May. I um, I'm very happy. All right, she was a Remainer, okay, but I think she's a decent, honest woman, and she will do what the nation, 17 million of us, asked. But she's happen. but she's not Robbie. I'm sorry, she's not. This you know, signing us up to a customs union for an yeah. indeterminate period of time <clears> is <throat> n- is not honouring the Brexit vote. And you make the point, Robbie, about, about how important we are as a marketplace. Yeah. You know why she hasn't. And I know they've used the Northern Ireland excuse to terrify her, but mm. why why we are not pursuing a Canada-style trade deal, or if they don't want that, just leaving. That's what we voted for, Robbie. She's not. She's not mm. really doing it, is she? It, yeah, it does worry me. This, but my feeling is, once we're out, that will start the domino effect, because there's plenty of other countries are happy to, to leave. All right. So, so leaving the treaty, then that's the big thing for you. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. No, thank you. And that's what Michael Gove thinks, I believe, and perhaps many others too. Well. I have to say, opinions divided. Um, someone there in support of the Prime Minister. You're listening to the Sunday edition of the Nigel Farage Show here on LBC, and it's 10.46. I get on Twitter, Robbie is right, Nigel. German industry call us Treasure Island for obvious reasons. I get that from Bournemouth. Yeah, absolutely. Robbie is absolutely right in saying how important our market is to the United Kingdom. Where I disagree with Robbie is I don't think Mrs May is using that card and playing it as she should be. Why are we going to stick ourselves in EU rules when only 12% of our economy is exports to the European Union? I don't think that works. I don't think it honours the Brexit vote. I think it is pretty much betrayal, I'm afraid. I'm sorry, that's how I feel about it. Tom says, Theresa May shouldn't have been PM during this Brexit era. It should have been a Brexiteer. Tom, absolutely. Brexiteers would lose another referendum, and they know it. John, I really don't believe that for a moment. Um, I do hear very disparaging remarks being made. There was a Labour MEP yesterday suggesting, oh, it's OK because Brexiteers will all die off and all the young people will vote Remain. Well, have a look around the rest of the continent uh, and you'll see it's the young people right across Europe who are voting for new political movements, who are rebelling and rejecting this I- this idea of centrism, you know, coming from Brussels. Indeed, opinion polls this morning 
show, I mean, okay, it's just one day, and I accept that, but showing Marine Le Pen above Emmanuel Macron for the European election polls that take place in six months' time. Um, Jamie is calling from Newcastle. Jamie, is this a price worth paying? Uh, no, definitely not, Nigel. Uh, checkers is checkmate. It's remain in another name. There you go. That's, That's really how I you think. feel. That's really how you feel, Jamie, yeah? Yeah, definitely. I think it's been it's been engineered um, to be to be rejected by Parliament, um, and then that will be then used as an excuse. Essentially, the MPs are useless, and we have to give it back to you, the people. You can decide mm. again on the nature of the deal, um, and it'll go down as either checkers or no deal. Um, and checkers is essentially going to be the Trojan horse, which the EU has generously given. Um, oh, yes. Be, uh, the, the, the EU are generous. We, 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 we've been given the spin already. The EU are being very generous, and they're yeah. allowing us to stay in the customs union, and they're allowing yeah. us to pay them nearly 60 billion quid. Wow, exactly. that's some negotiation, we're, isn't it? We're being, we're being played. It's, and it's leaving everything in place for the Remainers to become returners in the future. Mm. Five, ten years' time. It's all being put in place. Oh, I'm not worried about five or ten years' time, Jamie, because it will have fallen to pieces by then. I think. Right. Well, well, who knows? Maybe Italy will leave before we do. Jamie, I thank you. Completely agree with Robbie. I get by text. They need us more than we need them. We are one of the three jewels in their crown, along with France and Germany. Of course, they don't want to remove one of those jewels. Well, Rob, in Bristol, you know... We're going. June in Lowestoft says, our Prime Minister has no morals. She obviously has not considered coastal communities. When she said this year, no, com no community in Britain would ever be left behind again. If she keeps us in the customs union, she may as well kiss the fishing industry away. Well, June, at this point, is a very strong one because actually transition and no, no improvement for the UK commercial fishing quotas is going to mean that by the time we do li properly leave, if we ever do, there won't be much of that industry left, or indeed the angling industry either. So, so this, is, this matters. Uh, it matters a huge amount. No price is worth paying for losing our democracy, because it'll be the end of a thousand years of democracy, something that has guided us well. Chris, uh, what is, this is not about losing democracy. The vote was to bring it back, I thought. The, that's what I thought I was voting for us to be a self-governing, independent, democratic nation. That was my view. Um, Daniel in Cardiff, good morning to you. Uh, good morning, Nigel. I'm not actually in Cardiff, I'm in Timmouth. Oh, in Timmouth. Um, oh, well, mistakes uh, happen. Tim anyway, Tim Tim anyway yeah, I know where it is. Daniel, um, so pretty clear that she's going to do this deal with the EU. Um, our mm -hmm. MPs, our Eurosceptic MPs in particular, will face a big dilemma, as indeed were many Labour MPs, because Labour MPs from Leave constituencies will not want to, you know, Caroline Flint in Doncaster, for example, she's not going to want to be seen, is she, to vote they against want, They Brexit. want to call me government, don't they, at the end of the day? They want a Labour government. They do want a Labour government, but they also, you know, if you're a Labour MP and you've got a big Leave majority in a Midlands or a North or even a South Wales seat, if you're seen to vote against us leaving in any, any way, shape or form, it could be bad for you, couldn't it? Mm. Well, I, d I don't know how it's going to go with party politics, but I just think that our politicians have used up all their trust capital. And yes. what Theresa May is doing now is just a complete and utter betrayal. I mean, if, if you'd allow me to, yeah. um, I I've got a Leave EU video that you guys put up this morning, half an hour ago, of Theresa May herself speaking about the Customs Union. Yeah. And I've got it on a loudspeaker here. If you allow me to put it on. Go on. And I'll, just Go on. I'll indulge you. Go on. All right, cool. What you're getting out of the Customs Union is that we will be leaving the European Union, so we will be coming out of the Customs Union, and coming out of it means that we can do three trade deals. Absolutely. Well. Yes, Prime and Minister. But you wanted Labour to negotiate a new comprehensive Customs Union. That would mean we couldn't do our own trade deal. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and actually, oh, I like this, Prime Minister. She's great, isn't she? Isn't she? The end, uh, Go it is leaving the Customs Union. Yeah, absolutely. But what I have to say uh, is not credible to the Honourable Gentleman. It's a Labour Party policy that wants us to be in a Customs Union and giving all the power to negotiate. Sorry, I have to put my phone away from my ear. With no no say say it. <laughs> Daniel, it's great stuff. Well done. It involves the UK <laughs> staying in the European I, I've never, I mean, Daniel can play. But, the, but Daniel... Daniel, 
in plain English. Hello? Daniel, Daniel, enough's enough. Honestly, I can't take any more. I can't take any more of her dishonesty. It goes on. There's, there's no, I'm sure it does. I'm sure it does. But here's the point. There's another 30 she, seconds. She, no, that, no, you've had your time. She has made promise after promise after promise to the British people, including in a general election, and now she wants to do the opposite. And I think... Can I, can I tell you what my, my friend from Luxembourg's dad said, said about her? Go on. I went to Luxembourg... He, it's, it's quite unpalatable. Uh, well, no, 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 is it no clean, Daniel? No, no swear words involved. Good. But at the time, I thought it was an abhorrent comment. I had to leave at half two in the morning on an Eastern European bus because it just made me feel quite frankly disgusted. But he called her a political prostitute. Mm, is what he called right. her. Right. Uh, well, that's a, that, 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 that's, and, that's a term that does get I used. Leave. But... I had to leave Luxembourg early in the morning because I didn't feel safe there anymore. I thought, if that's how they treat us... And my friend from Luxembourg actually said to me, as we were walking down the boulevard in Luxembourg where they're building multi-million pound European office building. Oh, yeah. He said, he said democracy's not such a wonderful thing, is it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it says a lot. Daniel, thank you. Uh, Michael Caine was interviewed about Luxembourg recently. He said, when I was growing up, I thought it was a radio station. Now I realise it's a country, and they don't seem to like us very much. I think he was referring particularly to Juncker. Julian Coventry, time is short, but please tell me, is this deal a price worth paying? Um, no, I think it's terrible, but I wanted to ask you, Nigel, what would happen, I'm not 100% sure the way it works, if they put, instead of either of the two choices mm -hmm. that you've given, what would happen is if they put in a leadership challenge, if everybody that was to leave went behind a mm. one leader? Well, they haven't got the guts to do it, Julie. They've had, they've had chance after chance to do this, and they've never, ever managed it. Uh, I just wondered if that's what they were waiting for until well, they, they well, can't really sidestep it anymore. They've well, got to do something it, for the sake of the country. It may come to that, but they don't seem to be terribly brave, Julie. Um, and and it's, it's, it seems to me that loyalty to party seems to matter rather more than loyalty to almost anything else. Julie, David Mellor said how disenchanted he was with our political leaders. I feel the same. Do you? Um, yeah, well, I actually have joined the Conservative Party in the hope that it would go to a leadership challenge. Okay. So at least I could vote. But I think there's quite a few people that feel in the same boat. Mm. Um, so if only they would put it to their members, um, I would vote for um, a leave at Brexiteer any For day. Brexiteer? No, Julie, I'm sure many others would. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, this one will run and run.